Even kijken. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, on this uh, socius uh, lecture for everyone, and especially, of course, for our distinguished guest, Morris Glassman. Uh, the next line I had was welcome in the house of Europe, because uh, a quarter of an hour I, I was on the wrong address. It should have been there uh, a month ago, but uh, then uh, Morris was snowed in in London, so we had to uh, skip that uh, uh, idea. But I didn't know it was here. So my next line, and I will keep it because it, it's, uh, it has some relevance. Welcome to the House of Europe, which is not here, but I thought so. Which is for Morris Glassman, I would say, the lion's den. Because uh, one of the taboos for this afternoon, and I'll break it immediately, was we are not speaking about Brexit. <laughs> Mr. Glassman is not only uh, uh, a conservative uh, laborist, laborist, can you say that or not? Okay. But he is uh, a Brexiteer. And uh, 10 minutes ago, he was smoking a cigarette outside, also a taboo, but smaller than Brexit. And he asked uh, uh, me and the other people that were over there, yes, you used to hate Germans, isn't it, here in Holland? And then we say, well, that's, that's all, uh, that's gone. And, well, who do you hate now? <laughs> and I said, well, we hate Brits now. So, and that is, I think, in this audience, that will be quite right, because we all hate the Brexit here. We'll talk about it later. So my name is Martin Sommer. I'm a political commentator of uh, Volkskrant. Uh, the order of the afternoon is I'll give uh, Mr. Glassman the floor we say for 20 minutes, half an hour, and then I'll cut him off. Then we'll take place over there. I'll try to make some uh, remarks and we'll have a discussion, let's say again, half an hour. Then the floor is yours uh, uh, for, for questions, uh, which are always interesting in this kind of setting. So I hope you, uh, you, will, you will ask questions, uh, uh, the more, well, nobody afterwards will speak one word about it. I just heard that. And then half past six, we'll have a drink and uh, talk it over, I think, over there. So that's the order of the afternoon from now until half past six here in this uh, room. Now, Maurice Glassman. Um, a few words. Can I, I call you a political philosopher? Is that, is that, is that right? That's allowed, yeah. yeah, that's allowed. And he's like Mrs. just said, he's a, lab, a labor peer. I saw pictures of him in, the, in some red. It was not velvet, but what is it? Ermin. Ermin, OK, Hermelijn. So he's a professional Hermin flea, we would say in, in Dutch. Now. Morris Glassman was born, raised in a Jewish family in uh, Britain. And I think the Jewish is also relevant for your uh, line of thinking, but you may, maybe you will speak about that later. He studied history and political philosophy. He also played the jazz trumpet. You still do that? Yeah. He plays the jazz trumpet. His favorite thinkers you read in this very interesting not easy book, are uh, Aristotle and I think Karl Polanyi, if I may say so. He was a professor in Bologna and at London Metropolitan University. And in 2011, you just heard it, he was elevated, so to speak, in the House of Lords for the Labour Party. <coughs> now, the very interesting thing about uh, uh, Mr. Glassman is that he makes this for a strange combination of socialism and conservatism. And I think this combination, especially in the Netherlands, is absolutely a non-starter. For your information, in the Netherlands, we have this uh, expression of a, a Catholic bishop, I think a, a, a century ago. His name was Nolens, and he said famously, in the Netherlands, you have an easier life as an arsonist or a thief than as a conservative. So uh, in Nederland kun je beter zijn een brandstichter of een dief 
dan een conservatief. And I think this saying is still very relevant at the moment. So that's a very interesting position Mr. Glassman takes. And in the same year of 2011, he coined the word, the word blue labor. Uh, I would say that his specialization is the crisis in the Labour Party, which of course is interesting for this country. Our Partij van de Arbeid has always looked at the other side of the channel, London, and certainly I think more than 10 years mirrored the ideas of the third way of Tony Blair and is, is in, in, in the current crisis which goes on already also for some years. Now, Mr. Glassman started uh, uh, Blue Labour after, I think after Gordon Brown took a terrible defeat. Was, was it after? No, it was the financial crash. Uh, the financial crash, well, you, you will explain. The, the, the name Blue Labour, I asked him on telephone, and for your explanation, it has triple sense. Blue, it's not the red Tories, but the blue Labour. So it's blue, like the blue color of the Conservatives, of the, of the Tories here in, in the Netherlands, like the VVD is also blue. And like Bokestein once said to me, well, now we, we are all in the Netherlands blue, which was true at the time. So blue Labour, the first sense is conservative and socialist. And the second sense was, uh, well, the blues is not only a jazz trumpetist, but also a blues trumpetist. And the blues means things are not going well, ladies and gentlemen. And the third sense was like a joke. Mr. Glassman is a fan of Tottenham Hotspur. They are blue and certainly not Arsenal who are red. May I give the floor to Maurice Glassman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I haven't got too much more to say, so uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. And I really, really appreciate you coming out on such a, a cold evening. I know, I know that with Brexit you thought that maybe you'd be liberated from British politics, but here I am. And uh, it, it's very good uh, to be with you. Um, and, and I just want to say that the very beginning on a very political moral point is, is that the, the, um, the war in Ukraine happened after I wrote the book. And I am proud of my government that they've taken a very strong position in support of Ukraine. And it, it is noted, most certainly, um, that your government has done, the, has done the same. So maybe the story is not quite over between our countries quite yet. Um, whether we're in the House of Europe or the condominium, who can, who, who can say? But I also want to say uh, thanks to Ceceres, um for, for all, all that you've done. Um, there's a very, very, very strong alignment between my ethics and politics and, and what you do, uh, and that will come out. But I particularly want to say thank you to, to Cor, who's been unbelievably kind to me over so many years. I, I write things and I don't believe anybody reads them. And then I get an email saying, oh, I read your piece and, um, and a very strong reflection. So Cor, I really have appreciated it um, over all these years. And, and you know, there's many ways of, of looking at things. But I thought when I was thinking about what to say to you, I was thinking maybe the, we're an island and, and really you should be. And so I thought maybe water would be the best way of conveying um, what Blue Labour's um, Blue Labour's about. And I'll just begin there. So when it comes to, you know, I've had many sad years as an academic. I don't know if any academics here, but, you know, there are moments when you can say that it is deeply blue, particularly in committee meetings about procedures and admissions and curriculum and transferable skills and all those things that we don't really care about. And, um, and you know, a word that really gives me the blues is the word post, you know, post-modern, post-liberal, post, it's lazy, I think. So, um, so I, I'm a bit of a dissident in this regard. So I'll just 
say that I reject the term post-liberal because I love liberty. I really love liberty um, a great deal. And it's just to say that liberalism took a really bad turn, probably about, you could say maybe with Kant, but I'm more generous to Kant than most, uh, but I would say certainly post-war, um, in, in that it sees the human being not as a social being, not as a being that inherits from the past, not as a being that is constituted by love and relationships, but as an autonomous chooser outside of those relationships, outside of those traditions. Um, so in that sense, I've always tried to distance myself um, from those two words, both post and liberal, you know, um, um, and I'll try and explain what all that's about and, and what Blue Labour. So just to carry on with the idea, just to give you an idea of what it's like, because you're right, it sounds a bit confusing. And, and England is a strange country, just as you probably know. And I know that you are, that a lot of that comes from the television and then you actually meet English people and you realise it's all true. But, um, but in, in, in Britain, we didn't have this divide between um, the secular and the religious within the Labour movement. Um, it was within the same movement. In fact, the Labour movement, and I'll say more about it, was constituted very strongly by Catholic and by non-conformist Christianity. You could say that the two forms so you could say that the Conservative Party was a form of the Church of England at that time, no longer. But, and the Labour movement drew upon um, two what would, could be considered in continental Europe to be opposed forces, Catholicism and radical Protestantism. Um, but they did come together and they did it within the framework um, of the Labour movement. <coughs> and so I just want to say that that's one of the distinctions is that the confessional divide was, was not was not as strong, and, and it wasn't really until the 1960s that, that Labour could even speak of itself not as a Christian party. It used to be very explicitly Christian, but, but not, um, but as I say, a very, what you might call a broad church. So I just want to talk about that a bit and talk about uh, the way I see. So view, view Blue Labour as a river, right? Okay, so it's a river. And let's say that there's three tributaries to that river. I mean, there's, there's many more and in nature it moves like that. But I just want to talk about the three main currents that flow into the, flow into the river. And the first is most certainly um, from the Bible. And that's the fundamental idea. You know, I used to get a, into a lot of trouble in the Labour Party when it started because they said, what's all this religious stuff? It's all sexual abuse and patriarchy and the oppression of people. And I would say, well, at least religious people don't think that the free market created the world, you know, that there was something maybe anterior to that. And deep in the mix is this idea that human beings and nature are not commodities. They're not produced as commodities. They're inherited, and we can talk about all the but there is an element of sacredness to nature and to human beings, however we wish to conceptualize that. Um, and, and that is fundamentally um, the idea behind it. And then the idea is, is that one of the big ideas that, that we argue for is that society has become contractual, um, very utilitarian. You, you meet people for specific reasons and, um, <coughs> But we need to renew the idea of a covenant, of a binding moral and political set of relationships um, within which we can disagree and within which we can have our political arguments. But, but nonetheless, that we are bound um, together. Uh, and it's not altogether chosen by the individual, that you inherit certain obligations um, from the past. So I can talk more about that as we go on, but certainly uh, the renewal of the idea of covenant that comes from the Bible, but most particularly uh, Catholic social thought is the fundamental thing. I wrote my uh, PhD, my, my doctorate at the European University Institute in Florence. So you can see I'm a double heretic in my, in my politics. And, I, you know, Rhineland capitalism that you're talking about, you know, this was a wonder to me. What happened, particularly after the war, um, in Germany, how could it be that there was this 
mitbestimmung with the representation of workers on the boards how could it be that there was this vocational training system you know the handwork system where voca where you weren't allowed to enter the labor market until you'd gone through the vocational training and all those things how could it be that there were all these regional banks and there was and there were sectoral specific banks this wasn't exactly capitalism as i as i understood it um and i was trying to my PhD that I was doing, I, you know, I, I, my first political, big political engagement with was the Solidarity Movement in Poland. I mean, that's how old I am. Is, you know, a, a Catholic trade union took on communism and won. You know, this was an incredible. But then I realised, you know, that Goldman Sachs was a lot more powerful than the Catholic Church when they actually Poland came to its transition, shock therapy, free market what I call market Leninism, the absolute destruction of the trade union, the elimination of any sense of place, the, the certainly no representation um, of workers, the abolition of all the forms of vocational training. Uh, so my, my PhD is called, it's published as a book quite a while ago, it's called Unnecessary Suffering. That was how I conceptualized um, all of that. But what I realized when I was um, doing my PhD um, was this that it was far more Catholic than anybody in the textbooks was telling me that um, I, that was for sure. So that so I discovered Catholic social. Thought, I know that Laudato Si is is beloved of Sosiris. I just want to say that for me, um, Centesimus Annus and Laborum Exercens are the magnificent encyclicals. If anybody is ever interested in reading papal encyclicals, particularly Laborum Exercens, on human work, which is a magnificent validation of labour, of the meaning of labour um, and, and the sacred nature of labour. And, and the way that that works within uh, blue labour uh, politics is essentially uh, three, well, you could say four principles um, of Catholic social thought that frame what we do. Um, and the first is this idea of subsidiarity, which is a very strong stress on power being exercised at the most local level commensurate with function. And that's a, because what we find, and we found very intensely under Thatcherism, and then we found very intensely under uh, the third way New Labour experience, was that both capital and the state centralise. They concentrate and consolidate <coughs> what we had in our country was that all the wealth of the country was sucked into the city of London. And then in 2008, that's when Blue Labour was born, they said, oh, sorry, we've invested it all and it's all gone. And it was the people of the country who had to bail out the banking system. <laughs> it was the people of the country who had to bear that. That's where the blue, you know, it, the blue was also that sadness at the end of a road is the, is at the end of the road, um, certainly here. Um, of, of new labour, which suddenly looked very aged indeed. But this subsi subsidiarity is, is vital. The second, as I've mentioned in Catholic social thought, is the human status of the worker. That what, what is this rerum novarum, the first encyclical? This new thing is, is finance capital, is, cap is this form of finance capitalism where Pope Leo XIII said, that the worker is nothing more than a slave. And um, Archbishop Kettler, who's not Dutch, he was from Mainz, but was a very important figure in all of that, uh, you know, he said, um, if we're wrong, then Marx is right. You know, this is the nature of this, um, nature of this system. And so the status of the worker, and that status is done through uh, trade unions is one aspect, but also through the concept of vocation, also through the concept of skills inherited from the past, renewed in the present, that's manifest in, in a particular status within the labour markets. In other words, that the human being is not a commodity, that there is something precious in the inheritance of the application of good work, um, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, and so the status of the worker goes beside the sun. And then the third concept, which is, which is vital, is that solidarity itself, the idea that there is an obligation within a political community or any form of civic community for there to be a mutual responsibility and certainly a priority for the poor um, within that. And the fourth is, is, is the stewardship of nature, is that nature as well 
creation itself. So looked at in stark terms, um, capitalism wishes to commodify creation itself. It wishes to turn human beings and nature. So for me, I always understood democratic politics as the way that you resisted that, tempered that, tried to um, restore some form of human status for the things that capitalism wishes to do. But just to cut a very long story short, uh, the state is not really better than the market in this regard because the state tends to administer people, dissolve relationships, dissolve status, become extremely procedural. So the general historical analysis of blue labour is that over the last hundred years, and there's been very many resistances of very many ugly and not ugly kinds, is that the market and the state become the two dominant systems and society, societies, societa, just begins to disintegrate uh, and all the civic forms uh, begin to atrophy because they become dominated by either considerations of profit or considerations of power. Um, so the preservation of society, I think, um, is, is a sacred task for, uh, for both of us. But I just wanted to recognise the extremely important role um, the Catholic social thought um, plays uh, in the political theory of blue labour. The, the second tributary that runs through it is more classical and really goes back to Aristotle. Um, and it's the idea that, that, that we are social beings, that we are we are not individuals outside, that we are born into um, a set of relationships. It's vital to have liberty in order to work out the meaning of our lives. Um, but the starting point of the theory is certainly that we are born weak, vulnerable, dependent creatures, dependent on others for our flourishing. And that's a very um, important Aristotelian strain. Uh, as well as Martin, the Aristotelian idea, this is the whole Plato-Aristotle argument. Aristotle argued much more that you work within the values, the, what he called the doxa of your community, of your society, that, you, that politics goes on um, when, when you work within that and you don't take a position um, outside of that. Um, I would say that we've drawn very much on, on how that subsequently developed, not only with Aquinas, but also with Machiavelli and civic republicanism and self-governing cities. It's a much more secular form of democratic self-government that emerged from within that tradition. Um, and the third tradition, which is absolutely fundamental, is the labor tradition itself, is the tradition of the labor movement, which was that workers who found themselves completely deprived of their status, um, thrown into a pauper's grave when they died, um, expelled from the land. In England, we had the enclosures. They were just pushed off the, pushed off the land into the industrial cities. Well, they did something quite miraculous. And certainly, um, I can talk about that from, from my country, is that the first thing they did was that they built burial societies. And these burial societies gave a dignity in death that was absolutely fundamental. And they did that through mutual contribution. These were the, the mutuals. And then they built building societies so that they could have a home in the world after their dispossession. They pulled their resources. They built, um, they built uh, trade unions. They renewed local democracy. And this was all done on this ideas, these ideas, as I say, that were, were, were also as deeply Christian as they were secular within within my country uh, and and they redeemed the status of of um, the human being from these um, enormous forces that try to dehumanize them exploit them strip them of their memory strip them um, of their of their identity so those three things really um, the bible particularly catholic social thought um, the aristotelian tradition of virtue um, of, of the social being and of a self-governing city that comes later through uh, Machiavelli working within that and the labor tradition itself, the, the, the socialist tradition, um, all came together. So then, you know, then I had to eat something quite hard philosophically, just to say, which is that all of this I put forward as the politics of paradox that we had to be much more paradoxical in the way that we thought about politics. Now, what is a paradox? 
very briefly, a paradox is something that sounds wrong but is right. Okay, that's how I define. Uh, uh, so I'll give you, so for example, uh, blue labour paradoxes are like this: that tradition is the basis of modernity. You know, th so it sounds wrong, but then when you look at it, you realise that revolutions are insane. This is the conservative side of it because the past has a tendency to continue and that you tend to find the solutions and the political solutions by looking at and working within uh, traditions um, inherited um, from the past. Another paradox that drove people crazy was that faith will redeem citizenship. But what I found um, when I w was working, so a, a big part of the labour tradition for me is this idea of community organising. Um, I worked for many years uh, with a group called um, the East London Communities Organisation. It's based on, on an American guy called Saul Alinsky. It's about how to build up autonomous p power organisations for poor people um, in cities. And we worked on living wage. So I'll give you that example. I'll give you two examples of what we did. One was living wage. Another one was anti-usury. So when the crash came in 2008, and Martin, you want to know about being blue, right? Do you remember the banks were borrowing at half a percent and the poor were borrowing at 5,000 percent from payday loaners and no one could see a problem? You know, this, this was the reality um, of the moment. And when I went out onto the street and said, guys, what, what, what's going on here? It, it was the churches, it was the mosques, it was the synagogues who stood and said, it was very strange to me how the secular forms could not, they said, well, that's the way the market works, and uh, if you interfere with the market, you, you know, it, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, but the, the, the issue was it, it was that the faith institutions who actually acted. So these are the paradoxes I work with. Faith will redeem citizenship. Um, Tradition is the basis of modernity, and I, I try as a discipline, you know, the Jesuits have their tradition, I, I try to develop three paradoxes a day, you know, of which maybe one a week stands, the latest of which is, of course, universities are stupid. Okay, so there's a paradox for us to, to think about, uh, and, and I mean that in all of its forms. Um, so, so essentially, that's, I just wanted to explain to you um, those are the theoretical bases of, of Blue Labour, and it's very explicitly, uh, Martin, paradoxical in this way, because rationalism is an inappropriate form of politics. It can be appropriate if you're working out some policy stuff, but when it comes to generating coalitions, and this is what happened, I think, to, the, um, to social democracy in Holland and, and the fear that stalks me definitely in relation to the Labour Party, is that, is that in politics there's things like primary matter. So, you know, it, it's upset, people call it populism. I just call it politics. So, so in England, you know, it's as if the Second World War ended yesterday. You know, it's still a living memory in, in people's lives. I mean, the Norman Conquest is still alive. <laughs> But if you refer to the big, oh, but that's the primary matter. That's what I call primary matter in politics. And what's essential for any successful politics is to bring together contradictory matter. You know, so middle class progressives with quite conservative work. That's the coalition that was the bedrock. Um, but what I witnessed, and this is what I want to go back to the birth of Blue Labour, Martin, with, with in 2000 and and eight um, was that Labour had become completely disconnected from working class lives and concerns. It had become almost entirely urban, captured almost entirely by a concept of globalisation that it considered inevitable, in which working class played no meaningful role other than sort of like Native Americans on a reservation, people who should be given some welfare, maybe uh, an extra budget for the school for literacy so that everybody could go to university, so that everybody could be socially mobile, so that everybody could gain the benefits. And um, they couldn't understand what was going on. And they, I mean, I'll give you one example. In 19, 
70, spending in my country was equivalent on vocational training and universities. It was equivalent. And now it's 95.5. All the money goes to the universities. That's the idea that you go to university and that completely, and then they're told, well, yeah, but we need very large levels of immigration because we've got no carpenters, plumbers, bricklayers, you know, because there's been no training whatsoever for those. What I'm saying is, is, is that there was a, an abandonment of, of the working class by labour. This is a central, and that to restore a relationship between the two sides required something that you might say um, paradox was, <laughs> a paradoxical imagination was required to do that. And, and that explains all the different forms um, that, that Labour took. And I'll, I'll just go you know, further to that, is, is that we argue very strongly that there is a big difference between globalisation and internationalism. That globalisation accepts the dominion of finance capital as the deciding distributive factor concerning resources and sees any challenge to that as populist, wrong, diabolical, awful, terrible, wicked, and all those things that you thought about Brexit. And, um, and in contrast, we saw some notion of restoration of democratic accountability of elites as absolutely fundamental if there was gonna be any healing in the, in the politics. In other words, that there was a, an unaccountable um, financial and political world that despised poor working class people. That's how I would describe the scene roughly in 2008 and 2009. And if you take that analysis, then that would explain in a much more rational way the changes in the politics that have, have gone on since, which is just about some sense of, of restoring some forms um, of accountability. Now, remember, I'm a politician and I'm an academic, which means, technically speaking, I can talk for hours and hours <laughs> and hours. And talking about my own stuff, well, the temptation is diabolical. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting the message from your fingers, Martin, that I have spoken enough. What I do want to say before I start is that I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation I really would love to know what you think to, to begin this relationship with Sosiris, but also um, people here. I'm around today, I'm around tomorrow, and I would just love to begin a conversation about politics and about the meaning um, of, of a meaningful politics. And I just wanted to give a brief introduction to what the motivations um, are for the politics that I'm doing. So thank you very much. It's very. So, this one is for you. Oh. You have to take it yourself. But take it out. Yeah. Thank you. Did Uh You want some water? Yes, please. So I've got to ask you. Huh? I've got to ask you. Yeah. So, um, did any of that make sense? <laughs> Wait till, until I got the microphone. Okay, okay. <laughs> Always the best bits on the TV analysis are when they don't think they're on the microphone. Yeah. So that, you know, that's, that's always better. Okay. Well, I was asked... Oh. I was asked by uh, so serious to uh, make some remarks, but I wrote I wrote something down after re reading uh, the book because it's for me too difficult to to à bout pourtant. My French is better than my English. Shame on you. To, Shame uh, on you. <laughs> to give a reaction. So so I I made some remarks uh, on paper, but we we can start with a strong paradox. So there is definitely uh, a reaction on what you just said. Um, and I, I read in the book, one, one of the serious clauses in the book is left, the left does not understand the world anymore. 
and um, the strong feeling, your reaction after the new labor of Tony Blair was they do not understand what's going on. And I think we had the same uh, thing more or less in the Netherlands. Uh, I think the, our Wouter Bos in, in this, this period for the Partij van de Arbeid, uh, he was absolutely a, a very big admirer of uh, uh, Tony Blair and he was in the same strain and we had in, in these days the, the government, the, the coalition government of the liberals and the social democrats in our period of mm. purple, pars. Um, but the, 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 the paradox I wanted to put before you is the, the following. Uh, you say there is a conservative strain in your blue labor and of course there is this labor tradition, these two traditions. And you, you speak in the book, what I liked very much, about one, one of the guys that uh, inspired you, not only Aristotle, but, but also Edmund Burke. Mm. And Edmund Burke, you might know, he wrote his furious book about the French Revolution. He was very, very much against the French Revolution, and he was very much a conservative. He was not British, he was Irish. Mm. And now we come to this paradox, because, as we all know, Labour mm -hmm. is not only the Bible. No. Labour is also the French Revolution, very much so. And Labour is also, let's say, the, 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 the beginning of the individual, which to a certain extent is an invention of the French Revolution. We were not anymore the, 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 the estates, the standen, of the period before the French Revolution, but since the French Revolution, we were, we had become all individuals. So now we have, on the one hand, this conservative strain in your idea, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, there's the strain of the French Revolution. In my view, there is at least a paradox, and I will show you. I'll try to show you the the difficulty of that, which was in our purple government of the conservative slash liberals VVD and the left wing, our Labour Party, Pay van de A. This ended in, I would say, a, a, a general disenchantment because there was no left and right anymore in the Netherlands. One could not choose anymore. And then the people that you call uh, pol political people, the, the populists, they took the they took the role of the of the opponents of the Opposition. of the middle of yeah. the middle road, so to speak. So there, I see a problem for your blue labor. Do you see what I the, the paradox that I mean? I do. Yeah. Yeah. You're saying it's not a paradox; it's a contradiction. Is is what? Yeah, you're but uh, you say it looks wrong, but it's right. So that yeah. you're, you're going to argue that now. Yeah. So. Mm. I could be a little superficial and say that it hasn't really gone well for France since the French Revolution. I could, I could <laughs> say this. I could say that, um, that they've been yearning for a king, you know, in various forms, yeah, and do. that they've never really settled on a stable period of government. You could, you know, one of the things that I, you know, you mentioned earlier being being Jewish, and this is, I think, part of this story, is that the gratitude I feel to my country for just being alive is, is an amazing thing. And I do recognize that it's this very strong combina combination of a certain radicalism and a certain conservative, you know, that the, we kept our parliamentary system. We didn't, we didn't have a, um, a revolution. We kept a concept of place, which I think is absolutely vital. So there was a limit on the abstraction of the mass mm. democracy. The constituency forms mean that our general elections are really a series of local elections going on. Um, that does that does temper. Yeah. So so in in other words, what I'm trying to say is, is that one of the dangers of modernity is a inhuman abstraction, you know, liberty, equality, you know, these are very abstract, um, are very abstract forms. And I do think that 
um, local institutions bind people together in very important, in very important ways. Um, and I wouldn't say I would, you know, obviously I would take a then I would take a, a more socialist position on the French Revolution and and say that what it led to was the elimination of the guilds. What it led to was the beginning of the um, of a sense of place in 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 France that was very corrosive of the distinctive forms of um, of French culture. So it it remains the case that I'm. I'm, I'm more sceptical about the, the French Revolution. It was, a, it was certainly a bourgeois revolution, but the forms it took with Napoleon, the forms it took with authoritarianism um, were very disturbing. So ultimately, what I want to say to you is that I was pleased. I'm pleased that we beat them. You know, <laughs> that, you know that, that Napoleon was taken but to a let, very let, distant let me island. state the question even simpler. Yeah. In your view, you make a combination of socialism and conservatism. Yeah. Where does it leave the opposition? Okay, so that's it. So central to the then this is much more important. Okay, so in my work, there's a very big critique of conservatism, and this this critique goes right back to Burke, and it is very much alive in my country at the moment. Is that conservatives in within the Anglo tradition did not see the revolutionary power of capital and Burke was equivalent he he didn't like the French Revolution he loved the American Revolution you know by the way he thought that was magnificent and one of the reasons he thought it was magnificent was the sanctification of private property and the you know these these forms of quite strong um, liberal constitutionalism which I would say um, are inappropriate but above all What, what, what's happened in my country, and you could see it with, with Thatcherism, the resistance to the domination of the rich, the resistance to the domination of the power of money was not present within that conservative tradition. So the reason why I, I stressed the blue, other than the sadness of my football team, was that also because of the left in my country had become so progressive they despised what you might call everyday morality you know a family life of mutual obligation and when i used to say but these are labor things people go no they're conservative they're they're, they're conservative things so there was a there was an argument going on with me with two different things there was an argument going i was having with the left on why are you so contemptuous of the ordinary life of people. Mm. Why, why do you wish to humiliate people to yeah. this extent? And then I was having a simultaneous argument with conservatives saying, you're not conservative enough in your mm -hmm. protection um, of those things because of your embrace of a turbo capitalism that disrupts all forms of stable life. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Martin. But, but the, the, the question is still, there because the points that you are making uh, let's say cultural conserv conservatism is, if i may yeah. restate it so is re re retaken by uh, boris johnson who who won on that ticket yeah. uh, his his election in in 2019 so uh, if if you would be completely logical would would you have to go over and say okay i have to confess i'm a conservative so i have um, tories is my place now uh. Okay, the answer is no, right? <laughs> of and, course. Uh, and, but th this is lived history. So what, what, you know, this is just a bit of, and forgive me for doing cultural translation. Um, f from the period 1945 till roughly 1985, uh, my party was historically, the Labour Party was historically anti-Europe, anti-EU, mm. right? Um, it was anti-EU because it considered it a boss's Europe. And you, there was nothing, you, once you signed these treaties, there was nothing you could do politically to change them. They were outside of democratic control in this regard. Um, and then there was a flip. There was a flip. Do you in, the, in the party? Uh, yeah. Um, Jacques Delors, you know, social Europe and... Famous, and, famous Labour politician. 
Uh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In England. Yeah, exactly. He yeah. became, yeah, up yours de laws was the yeah. response of the song, <laughs> yeah. Um, but also it was a response to our political weakness, is that we'd been defeated by Thatcherism, the whole, the Labour movement was was very much um, on the defensive. There was a lack of an articulation of an alternative vision to regulated, globalised capital. I mean, this all came out with new Labour. You know, this was all um, long term. Now, what I'm saying is what happened along that road is, is a real disaffection by poorer people with the operation of politics. It wasn't just working class people. Poorer people generally asked the question, where do we fit into this politics? And the answer was nowhere. You just be quiet, go to school, be better people, go to university, be more liberal and shut up. You know, that was roughly the... But they didn't take it that way. They took it as an offence and they took it... So, yeah, so that, that became the question. And what happened was, is that the Conservatives then became the Eurosceptical party. That's mm -hmm. the Boris Johnson story. He said that there would be levelling up. He said that there would be a new model of capitalism. So my response to that was, oh, really? Well, let's see, what have you got? Uh, and what are, you, what, what are you doing? So Blue Labour there really took a very active role in the debate. So we articulated these things that I talked about in the speech. So the first thing that we articulated was that there should be worker representation on the boards of all companies above 50. Above 50 people, there should be elected rep representatives of the workforce. We argued that 10% um, of the bailout from the 2008 should be used to establish um, regional banks where people could have uh, local businesses and people could have access to capital in the places uh, that they lived. Uh, yeah, we did, uh, we did say that you should maybe close down half the universities and turn them into vocational colleges. That didn't go down so well among certain groups. Um, but we ri but worked with a guy called Andy Haldane, who was at the Bank of... I mean, it was a serious... Um, the Conservatives didn't do that. They said, we're going to do this levelling up. So, so we're now at a juncture in our politics where people recognise that the Conservatives do not have either the will or the intellectual range mm -hmm. to resist capitalism, yeah. right? Yeah. So this okay. is what we've seen with the, def the defenestration of Boris Johnson um, was effectively a coup by the City of London to reassert, like, what is... Or, I mean, do you think really that having a piece of cake and a uh, glass of champagne is really a sackable... Of, you know, that wasn't what it was about. And now you've got a Goldman Sachs banker. So, but you have but also. The, I don't. What was the month you you published your book last year? In in what month was it? It was September. September. So the, this whole yeah. disintegration of the Tories and 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 Johnson was in full swing, so to speak. Uh, yeah, but that was uh, way after. Because you know, books are weird. You you give them to the publisher, and then a year later they're published. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but what in, I would in, say, what, 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 what I, I would want to ask is, in the meantime, we're half half a year further now. Uh, in, in in Britain, the atmosphere has changed about Brexit. I think more than half of people now has the idea: was it a very good idea? And if you compare uh, the situation of the workers in in, in Britain with the workers in Europe and well we're 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 the EU slaves but I think the position of workers in Europe is absolutely better than anywhere okay. in Britain. Okay. For instance I see, in terrible, where, I see in what you're got terrible France. I, I would say really contra what you're saying yeah. is is that what's happened since Brexit is a genuine sense of volatility in the politics, that the politics is alive. The, the, what you what you don't have is a sense of oh, nothing's no. at, the, at the moment. You mean no? Ever since ever okay. since the yeah. um, the Brexit referendum, it's been. I mean, I'll, I'll give you just um, a, a couple of examples um, that the really you know just bellwethers. But just to begin, my response is saying that this is a long term to reassert a degree of 
democratic sovereignty is going to be a long journey. I don't take the ups and downs of, so that we've got a conservative, obviously what I'm building for it is a Labour government that can genuinely have a pro-worker policy and it's legal to do so. I mean, that was my point about Maastricht and that was my point um, about Lisbon, is that it was effectively illegal to resist capitalism that you, could, you couldn't do because of the competition law and the various mm -hmm. constraints. Um, so I, I, I just think we're at the very beginning of this story. But what there is, is a, is a huge change in the temper and the tone of our politics. People get angry, they do things, things change. I mean, it's a small example, but it really meant something to me. Did, did anybody here follow this thing with the European Super League, this football thing? Right, so it was Juventus, it was Inter Milan. I don't really think any Dutch clubs were involved, bless you. Um, but it was also Barcelona, Real Madrid, and then it was Man City, Man United, Liverpool, Arsenal, and unfortunately Tottenham. I don't think we did anything to deserve to be in it. But the brilliant thing about this was that no one got relegated. It was just a cartel that would play each other all the time and preserve their position as elite European clubs. Now, what was interesting to me is that football fans in England went completely berserk. They just, demonstrations outside clubs, enormous. Within four days, the government had Retracted. said, this is illegal, no, really, you can't do this. It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. But in Italy and in Spain, not a word. Mm -hmm. And Agnelli, who was then so, now so, up for criminal so charges. idea, there's a, a new political uh, engagement. Uh, All the time. And this is going on. Uh, what I'm saying is, yeah. is the, the politicians, it's scary. I'm in Parliament and I see, the, I see it happening. I'm not saying that the politicians know how to respond. You know, suddenly they are accountable for what they... It used to be the case, say, we can't do anything about that because of the EU and we can't do anything about that. They blame the EU, but now they are, and it's very mm. scary for them, and people are disintegrating and they don't know. But what's essential about the politics that I'm putting forward is that it gives a framework for a better deal for, certainly okay. for workers within well, the, Let me ask me your, my last question and then we'll go to the yeah. room. Uh, I, that's the same question so, I ask you on the telephone, because we have in the Netherlands a party more or less along the lines that you propose, which is the Socialist Party, the SP, uh, with a, a, a clear conservative strain in it, with uh, uh, concern for the, for, for the daily troubles of, of the people who have a tradition of going from door to door and asking people for their concerns. So they, and they have a, a, a kind of cultural conservatives, conservatism, and on the other hand, they're quite radical, socialists, yeah. but only nine seats in Parliament. So they, they, there is something in this time which restrains uh, uh, this kind of party, at least in the Netherlands, to, to really break through. What is your idea about that? Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to pronounce on the SP. No, no, uh, but you, but, you can pronounce but, on the more, more generally on, on the line of thought, what's going on? Look, um, in terms of developing um, this politics, you know, it's, it has to be from within the mainstream, this is what I believe, you know, um, of, the, of the political parties. Um, been a huge pressure on me, you know, to form a new political party or it is, it is the, um, I've certainly resisted all of those, all of those um, things. It, it's the articulation as well. This is a, the paradox. There's got to be a renewal of organisation on the ground and the subsidiarity is vital, but there's also got to be a very strong national economic policy, you know, a, a very distinctive, um, which we call, um, you know, civic renewal and national renewal. Those two things um, go together. So, uh, and it's very difficult to, I mean, in our, in our system, you know, unbelievably it's possible to win elections. 
you know, you can win an election and you can do things. Uh, I think there's still a huge amount of scepticism about whether anything will change. You know, this is what we confront all the time. And it's worth, I know, you know, it's a very narcissistic, egotistical thing I'm going to say, but time goes very quickly when you're enjoying yourself. I, I'm very aware that That's the clock. clock is whizzing round. <laughs> um, but it's still, you know, one thing I want to share with you is that the Brexit referendum was the highest vote in British political history. I mean, over 80% of people voted. And what shocked me was that all the people who said to me, oh, we've really got a problem with political engagement and we really, people really must vote, they were furious. They were disgusted that so many people voted because they lost. You know, they wanted them to vote, but they wanted them to vote a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, and what that, what that indicates to me, so, so what that indicates to me is that there is a public appetite for a meaningful politics. Sure. Um, but they're very aware that they're not getting it. So this, this is the rumbling going now. now and, and what you say is that you have to do it in the mainstream. That's why you say a, yeah. a small party will have a, a very difficult time of, of, of coming through. Yeah, be, because you, know, you could say you're going to have a radical economic policy and then you've got to do a coalition agreement with a whole load of other, you know, people... Well, that's know, the principle here. And yeah, yeah, like they, you know, so, so, so how's, that, yeah. how's that all going to work out? So, yeah, I'm very adamant on that in relation that, um, to remain within very much committed. And, and to say what I said to you a few moments ago, which I'm very sincere about, I'll tell you a funny, I'll tell you one funny story because my country is a funny place. Is So, um, just to let you know, and this is true, um, my side did not expect to win the referendum, okay? We thought we'd do a gallant, you know, a gallant game and then, oh well, there you go, good luck everybody. So I'm just letting you know that when the referendum result came through, it was shocking. There was an element of shock. Uh, and obviously, as you can see from subsequent events, no one had a clue. No one gave any attention to what was going to happen next. You know, it was quite an interesting experience. We could talk about it another time. But what I had so bear in mind, so in my party, let's say that there's at the time of the vote, there was something like 250 uh, Labour MPs and there were about over 200 Lords, Labour Lords. Now in the Lords I managed to really get a mighty coalition of six Labour Lords who agreed with Brexit, so that was that. And in the House of Commons, nine. Okay, so this was a very minority position um, within the party and it was okay during the referendum because they thought we were going to lose. Right? So, I'm just letting you know that walking into Parliament the day after the referendum vote was not an easy social experience because <laughs> um, there is a tendency of very progressive people to be very unpleasant when they lose uh, or on the... So I was aware that I was walking in as the embodiment of fascism, populism, new, you know, the Third Reich was suddenly walking the street. I mean, it was really like, oh, uh, so I had to be very, very... I had to be very disciplined and um, and basically I tried to say for a week that I didn't mean it, you know, it was okay, you know, like I'm sure everything was going to work out, but it went on for months. But anyway, on that day that I went in, uh, a man walked up to me who I'd never seen before, a very big man, and he said, Morris, you know, I, had n I said, who are you? And, and he said, oh, I'm the, he said, oh, you know. I'm, I'm, the, I'm Lord Salisbury, I'm the Earl of Salisbury, you know, he was born, he said to me, the sentence he said to me was, I'm born as a Cranmer, I marry as a Shaftesbury, I die as a Salisbury, I'm like, <laughs> and then I clocked, because I did history, his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather was Elizabeth I's <laughs> Prime Minister. Okay, so I said, oh, hi, yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. And he said, yeah, yeah. you know, let me ask you a question. He said, when was the Reformation? This is the Reformation in England. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to share with you that my mind wasn't really in this space at this moment. Uh, and I said, well, 15... <laughs> 
35, he said, that okay. He said, yeah, 5038. Yeah. I said, okay. And he said, when was the Spanish Armada? When did the Spain try to invade Britain? And that I knew because of bingo. It's 1588. And in England, 88 is two fat ladies. So two fat ladies, 88. So I was like, yeah, 1588. He goes, very good. And so then he said to me, so remember, he said, Brexit, Brexit took 50 years last time. Take it easy, <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, that's a true story. Um, but what I'm, the reason I'm telling you that story is this is a long-term historical, this is not just who's going to win the next election, okay. what's the government going to be like, are they going to... We now have a freedom to build a political economy outside of the EU. Use your mic. Or outside of the EU. That's the thing that really, and it's legal. We can, we can do it if we could get a democratic support for it. And what I'm saying to you is what I'm feeling in the country is an energy and a volatility that this is very far from settled okay. yet. I think we did not speak about Brexit. We never mentioned it. Of course, so I, we I'll promised we wouldn't mention it and we never have. <laughs>